thrilled to welcome acclaimed author Joy Kagawa to discuss her lifelong career as a writer, her experience as a child growing up in the internment camps in Canada, and her thoughts about how we can prevent a humane catastrophe like this from happening again. Joy Kagawa is the author of novels, children's books, a memoir, and books of poetry. She is best known for her 1981 classic novel, Obasan. Based on Joy and her family's forced relocation from Vancouver during the Second World War when she was six years old. She was made a member of the Order of Canada, the Order of BC, the Order of the Rising Sun, and has received seven honorary doctorates in literature, law, and divinity from several Canadian universities. She won the 2019 Plain Commune Award of the 360 Film Festival and the 2020 Canadian Screen Awards Best Video Game Narrative for East of the Rockies. She is also the recipient of several Lifetime Achievement Awards. Without further ado, please join me in giving a warm welcome to Joy. Hello, Joy. Welcome to Google. Hi. How are you doing today? <laughs> Whatever this is. That's great. Well, I mean, at 86 years young, you definitely are, <laughs> you know, a very special guest for us here today. Um, and I'm curious, you know, you've seen your fair share of history, right? How have these past two years been for you relative to everything that you've experienced in your lifetime during this pandemic? Oh, during the pandemic, the isolation has been, um, well, it, it, it's hard, but it's also it seems um, a, a time for people all over the world to, to slow down, meditate, think through mm -hmm. and to face big questions because that's what silence and isolation enables us to. It's a kind of gift to come at this time when there's so much to think about. Oh, certainly. I feel like I open the news and there's a lot of conversations about climate, about politics, all sorts of things. So have you picked up any new hobbies during this time? Oh, <laughs> well, let's say eating. <laughs> it's been a time to... <laughs> a time to really um, focus on the physical health, which affects all the rest of your health, you know. Uh, but um, it's been, a, it's, it, for, for me, it's been um, a, a quiet, a welcome uh, kind of time. I mean, life happens, and this is what's happening now in the world for, for many people who are isolated. Absolutely. Thank you for sharing. Eating has also, I believe you said eating was one of the new hobbies, right? It also has become one of my new hobbies. I think I had to buy a few new pairs of jeans <laughs> for the winter. Next season, I'll fit into everything old again. But, um, you know, I'm, I'm also really curious. Are you in Toronto right now? Toronto, yes. Canada? Right. So, you know, I'm currently in New York City, um, but I'm curious to know COVID really amplified anti-Asian sentiment in the United States. And have you felt differently in this regard in Canada and, and where you are? I, I wonder about that. You know, I hear about the anti-Asian uh, actions and, and I don't see it. So, well, I did see this one restaurant, a Japanese restaurant, that um, the windows were broken uh, twice. And hmm. um, so, that looked like an action of hate, but that's all I've been aware of. That's I, good that you're insulated from from that where you are. <laughs> uh, I, um, I, I just, I'm not sure why I do not see hate. It's possible that I, my, my fixation is to become what you behold and so to look mm -hmm. away from hate. You know, I wanted to talk a little bit about you because, you know, our audience today is primarily, I would say, American, right? Um, and so they may not have had the pleasure, like myself, of, of reading your work. Um, I'm, I'm Canadian, so I read a lot of your work growing up. Um, and I understand that, you know, this is a very personal topic, but you lived through Japanese internment during World War II, right? Your, your family was forced to move um, from what I believe was Vancouver to Slocan, British Columbia. Um, what do you remember? of that experience and how did it shape you and your work? Well, I think when you're very young, whatever is going on is your normal. And so mm. uh, I didn't question it. And, you know, what you are surrounded by, if you're fortunate to be able to be with your parents and your family, that's your reality. 
And um, so, you know, I was given from both my parents a strong um, sense of uh, this isn't all there is to life, all that we're going through. There is more. And uh, this, this more is essentially love. And um, having been given that from infancy, I feel I was uh, surrounded within a kind of dense atmosphere of the presence of, of love, which still fuels me and which still is very real to me. It reminds me of the book, I believe it was Viktor Frankl. He wrote Man's Search for Meaning. Right. And so, you know, I guess a sense of love that was instilled in your life helps you go through this difficult, you know, period of time. Do you remember anything about it? You know, how old were you when, when you were um, in the Japanese internment camps? Well, um, if, if you say, how old was I when I first learned about the power of love? I, I think I mm -hmm. had it from the very beginning. We were six, I was six, uh, going to David Lloyd George School and um, just ready to, um, I mean, I was turning seven when we moved to Slocan, to the internment center. And uh, it, forever after, there was a sense of paradise lost. I, I longed for uh, the urban life of Vancouver, the elevators, the Christmas things, <laughs> you know. And that, that's what I remembered as my paradise that was lost. So that's, I think that's why I'm an urban dweller to this day. I mm. love cities. Mm -hmm. And how long were you and your family there in Slocan for? We were three years and um, mm -hmm. set from seven to nine and going on mm -hmm. 10. And then from there, you know, the longing to go home was not met. So we went to Southern Alberta, which felt like hell to me because mm -hmm. it, it was a very arid landscape without trees. And the trees are very fierce. They were pruned severely. And so I felt sorry for the trees and, and uh, the lack of the green. It was a very, mm. a very bleak, harsh world where uh, Japanese Canadians were uh, essentially working in the sugar beet fields. It was very, very hard work. Well, for those of you who may not be familiar, Vancouver and just British Columbia in general is very lush, full of green. Um, it's a temperate rainforest, Vancouver, so we get a lot of rain. So I think Joy is alluding to the huge contrast in landscape that existed. Um, and I'm kind of curious too, when you moved to Southern Alberta, what was reintegrating back into life like, right? Because you've been through this very, you know, stark experience, even though there was love in your heart and love in your family, um, it was a big change from your life prior, right? How is it returning back to this quote unquote idea of normalcy, right? I ask this because a lot of us today have been living through a pandemic. It's been two years of a very different world. And suddenly we're slowly coming back to some idea of what this new normal may be, be like, right? So just curious to understand, what was you know, the reintegration like? Um, what did it feel like? Any memories that you may have around that? Well, um, what, I, what I remember as a child is uh, just the sense of paradise lost. It was the, the, the wonder of um, the life in, in Vancouver, the, the beaches, the water, the picnics, the life of the community, and, and the urban, urban life. That was gone, replaced by the internment camps where uh, people lived on row on row of, of little tar paper shacks. And uh, our family lived close to the mountains. There were a few families that lived in, in some of the um, abandoned hotels and things. Um, but what I, I had in Slocan was nature, the beauty of the mountains, the joy of, the, of nature. And uh, that sustained my memory of uh, uh, made it a joyful memory actually of the internment centers but then after that going to southern alberta and going to the harsh harsh weather there the extreme cold the extreme heat and the constant wind and uh, the snow and the blizzards and, and just the, the difficulty that was uh, that was uh, 
what what hit me <laughs> it felt like hell you know <laughs> and i ne never really wanted to go back back there but i can understand that people who were born there and raised there love it just like a friend of mine who was born and raised in the deep north where where there were many words for snow and he loved that so and i've heard of people that were uh, born on Smoky Mountain in the Philippines, which is a garbage heap, born there, raised there, and found the joy of, mm -hmm. you know, a little garden in the midst of this Smoky Mountain. Mm -hmm. So uh, I think that uh, children um, love, uh, experience that love when they are children, the love of their family, and that extends to even the hell of a mountain of garbage. Mm. So I think the takeaway um, from this experience is regardless of where life takes you or places you, there's always a silver lining or some happiness that we can search for if we look and find it. <laughs> like you're alluding to the garden in the garbage heap, for example. Well, I, th I think that uh, uh, there is some kind of like a tent of grace in which a child dwells and somehow if even in hell, um, when when a child experiences the love of their parents and so on, there is a kind of um, very special love that surrounds surrounds the child altogether. I I think I'm not well. I only know about my own childhood, of course, and and the childhood of my friends and and I look back on uh, Southern Alberta with. Um, a lot of fondness. Mm -hmm. That's a great segue into my next question, right? One of your most celebrated works and one that I recall many of my classmates and I reading while growing up um, is Obasan, right? And it chronicles the, the persecution and internment of Japanese Canadians during World War II. Um, why was it important for you to write Obasan and this particular story? Well, I remember when I first wrote it, um, John Newlove was the editor at McClellan and Stewart, and uh, he, um, it, it was, he, he thought it was just a long poem, and that if it was going to be something else, it needed to be skinnied out, you know, it needed to be filled in and made into a narrative and made prose, rather than just a long poem. So, um, so I took it back into myself for another year and skinnied it out, <laughs> filled it in, and made it a narrative. So uh, that, it, it, it took doing that. And then it was Louise Dennis of Lester and Orpin Dennis who um, saw what was in the book and suggested I take it into myself. And, mm -hmm. and so um, with with her editing and I, I think it became Obasan. And That's it, amazing. Was, mm -hmm. it, it, it was the copy editor in that house that uh, chose the name Obasan because we couldn't think of what to call it. I, did, I was thinking of uh, down the noonday street or <laughs> something like that, <laughs> these various titles and she picked Obasan. I, some and... people have asked me why that title, you know, and, Anyway, there it is. <laughs> so you had a whole team behind you to produce this book. Um, did the stories come from personal experiences that you had, uh, conversations with friends? Like, you know, where where did it originate from? Because well, this is not your first work. No, but for this book, it it was bookended by the prairies. The prairies in the beginning, prairies at the end, and life in between. In I wanted to understand how you decided to become a writer because while well, you know, learning more about you, I realized you studied at the University of Alberta and the Royal Conservatory of Music in Toronto. So what ultimately called you to, to writing? Well, I think I was, I think I was born a writer. Um, I, one of my earliest memories is uh, we lived in uh, Marple in Vancouver and there was a desk downstairs and there was one of those lamps, you know, those little table lamps with the heavy thing in the round lid and the light shining down. And one of my 
very earliest memories is being down there at, at the big roll top desk that my dad had and he's holding a pen and his writing with that pen. And I remember seeing my grandchild uh, looking with that same intense look in her eyes, seeing a pen in motion. There was something about that image, somebody holding a pen, somebody hmm. using it and squiggles appearing. Um, I think that's when I became a writer. I saw, <laughs> I saw writing happening. Mm -hmm. And um, so I, I can remember when I was seven years old and in Slocan, my earliest and constant prayer from that point to now was to know truth. I wanted to know truth. And in the 60s, I was living to write. I was just writing. But then there was a crisis in my life. Um, it was an emotional crisis. It was a spiritual crisis. It was, I, I needed to be able to love my husband. And I felt that no matter how hard I tried, I could not. So the pen then changed. Instead of hmm. living to write, I was writing to know life. And, hmm. uh, and with that change, um, several things also happened right about then when no the need to know what the deepest ideals that were in me below everything that i had been taught was to go into dreams and when i went into my dreams and wrote them down in the middle of the night um they were poems they that that's when poetry happened was in the 60s in moose jaw saskatchewan when when the images of of dreams uh, came through and that, that was the beginning of poetry for me. Well, I like what you just said there. Um, I, I kind of want to bring it up again. It was, you started writing um, to understand life, you know, and I think, you know, that that's a very specific practice um, that's very hard to do in the modern time, right? Everyone today is very, running on very little sleep. Some people don't have the time to jot down dreams, etc. So I'm just curious to know, you know, do you have any advice for the modern day aspiring writer? Well, I think that in our, our world today, we are a world that is enthralled uh, by the, the hope, the promise of uh, money. And uh, we bow down to it and it becomes the God that we worship. And I think the world is worshiping that. And I've always known that that was a false deity. And so there's in this um, glance away from that. And well, just not, not considering the power of that. I mean, in, so, in a certain way I do, but I just want to not not depend on it. And so mm -hmm. when I was starting to write, um, seriously, when I was writing Obasan, for example, mm -hmm. I would um, gather graphic paper, I found some graphic paper in garbage and I would use that. I would take that to the library, at the Metro Library in Toronto, and sit down there on the fifth floor. And on this graphic paper, I wrote my first and second draft of Obasan. And so, um, you know, and a writer can live on, I mean, you, you only need paper and pen to be a writer. And uh, so you're not dependent on having to have equipment, having to have the wherewithal hmm. to get the equipment and none of that is required. So just have a pencil or a pen, a piece of paper, that's all you need. So I have this saying that if you show up for the hum, the hum will show up for you. And showing up means having the paper and the pen. And if I show up with that, then the hum will show up. <laughs> I love that. And I think this is a great reminder for anyone who may be um, listening or watching today that if you want to write, you know, George just kind of distilled the basics for you. You just need a pen and a piece of paper. It's nothing complicated. You don't even need your laptop or anything else. You can just, you know, cool down, calm down, find some space. Um, 
And I want to kind of uh, move into another question about uh, storytelling and writing as well. Um, as mentioned before, I grew up in Vancouver, Canada, which also is your birthplace. Um, and growing up, I, I saw your novels sprinkled all throughout my life, the school library, the public library, and many classrooms. Um, in the 90s and early 2000s, it was rare as a young student at that time to see any narratives or stories about Asian families. Um, I think the emphasis of diversifying, you know, diversifying stories that get told just hadn't arrived yet <laughs> into that time. Um, and I haven't really read many stories about Japanese internment in, in Canada, right? What did publishers think when you first sent out copies of Obasan? You know, were they receptive? Not at first, no. Um, well, the, uh, there were some, I remember one press said it's well written, but we will never be able to market this. And so it mm. was a very well rejected book <laughs> and, uh, and uh, you know, got rejected far more times than I don't know, anything that I'd ever done. But I persisted. I just, uh, you know, like when I was writing poetry back in the 60s, I just had the habit of expecting them to be rejected, but sending them out anyway, just mm. automatically sending these out. And so I persisted with that, with this work. Um, I just kept sending it out regardless. And it was just, uh, I, I refused to be put, put down by the fact that it was rejected. I mean, I can remember my first short stories, rejection, 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 rejection. And uh, so, just getting used to rejection and living with it, but carrying on anyway. One of my friends is uh, almost my age, and she started very late and persisted. Now she's she's published tons of books. <laughs> so persisting, persistence is really, really, really matters. So let me ask you, I mean, I've, I've interviewed a lot of authors and all of them have mentioned that rejection was, you know, very widespread in their career. Sometimes it took them over a decade to get published or to write their first novel, um, you know, that was accepted by a publishing house. So I, I want to know um, when you got those rejections, what were you thinking in your head that helped you, you know, forge ahead and, and feel that, you know, I'm not going to let this affect my self-esteem, my self-confidence. Do you remember, you know, anything about what you were thinking every time you got a rejection? Well, I think I was expecting rejection. And hmm. um, so um, it, 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 uh, it was just a matter of habit. It became a habitual thing, simply to take in the rejection, not feel much about it, and send it out again. Keep sending it mm -hmm. out. So you built I, a thick skin. <laughs> but yeah, well, you built a thicker I, skin. Yeah. I, I just, I just, um, I went to the library and got this list of places to send things, and I just ticked them off and kept sending them out. And I remember James Rainey, who was in uh, wherever he was, and um, he was one of the people that kept rejecting things, but eventually he accepted things. So. That's wonderful to hear. Um, you know, speaking about you know your your work and the content of your work, you know, many people who have lived through history, like yourself, are now you know in, in my eyes, you know, you're essentially living history, right? You're a piece of history. You carry the history with you. Um, they're also getting a lot older. People who've experienced things like um, Japanese internment, the Holocaust, the Vietnam War, all those things. Um, how can we keep preserving stories that have meaningful consequence and impact on our world in order to prevent these catastrophes from happening again? Like, do you recommend, for example, that, you know, a grandchild, you know, record the story of um, his or her uh, grandparent? You know, how, how would you recommend that we get more, more rec you know, records of these things as time goes on? Well, I think everybody has their own forest fire within them. And um, when you go into the flames of your own life, whatever it is, um, you will eventually, you know, you'll get burnt certainly, but you'll mm -hmm. get to that safe place where the fire has been spent. So I think that um, every age, every person, 
uh, every situation is unique. And although we go through huge events like the Holocaust, mm -hmm. uh, the internment of Japanese Canadians is a, just a tiny little echo of um, the horrors that have been in the world. It's nothing like those, it's a little echo of it, but it's your own echo. And everybody has echoes, even if they've never, even if they're very, very privileged, everybody has their own form of suffering and they can write from within their own forest fire. The forest fire metaphor, I think, is is really wonderful. Um, I think I was just asking, how can we keep preserving these stories, right? So that we can prevent events like this from happening again, so that people are aware of what has happened in the world. Yeah, well, I think, you know, people have, um, like, a reality is Rashomon, you know, that everybody has their own look at whatever it is that's going on in their life. And even if a person has not been in the Holocaust or in whatever echoes mm -hmm. of the Holocaust there are, um, each person has their unique thing to offer. So um, what, what we preserve for others to share is, a, is what is common to, to us. And uh, what is common to us is human suffering, human love, um, all these these things will reach reach everybody. And um, then we, if, if we're interested in the various categories to prevent these certain categories from happening again, it seems to me anyway, that we're not going to eliminate suffering. Um, we will eliminate perhaps certain forms of it. I mean, we have not had mm -hmm. an atomic war yet. Um, mm -hmm. You know, we had that last bomb that dropped on Nagasaki. We have not had an atom bomb that has fallen on anybody again in that way. Uh, although we have all kinds of nuclear weapons all mm -hmm. over the place that are maybe have slain more people than the Nagasaki bomb last one did. So um, I think that do we progress? I, I don't know if that's your question, but do we get better? Do In some ways we do, and in some ways we, we don't. I think we're always in um, Charles Dickens' time when we are in the worst of times and in the best of times. <laughs> so, you know, how, how do we improve? <laughs> I, I do think that when we tell our stories, uh, we magnify them in some way, and we can see the things that cause certain things to happen and we can learn from them and we can try to uh, understand how to avoid them. Um, you know, whether they are natural catastrophes mm -hmm. or so-called uh, human-made catastrophes, but humans mm -hmm. are also creatures of nature. So I think that we should see human-caused catastrophes in the same way that we see naturally-caused catastrophes. That is without judgment, without blame. I mean, I, I, I'm, I'm saying this rather wildly, but I think that our energy should be on prevention and we should hmm. try, you know, with the, if Vesuvius is going to erupt again, let's do everything we can to get cell phones to the people there so that they can get out of the way of the big thing mm -hmm. that's coming and put our energies into uh, saving lives as much as we can, preventing further mm -hmm. harm. What can we do to prevent further harm? How can we find the forest fire within and, and, you know, face it to find the stories that we each of us may need to tell and write about? Um, and you're right. You know, I feel like throughout history, it's always a story of this was the best of times. And also there's always the worst of times as well. Um, so thank you for sharing that with us, Joy. Um, I want to approach this question because generally speaking, it's very rare to have guests, you know, who are in their mid eighties on any talk show or um, public speaking event. And I think it's a shame because I think there's so much knowledge that has been lived through one person, right? And I've heard that you've been thinking a lot about um, a term that you've coined, the decline of the mind, now that you're in your <laughs> mid eighties. <laughs> Can you tell me a little bit more about this and what you've been thinking about? Well, I know that um, the decline in my case particularly is associated with loss of memory. And um, 
So it's not loss of creativity or loss of capacity to think, mm -hmm. but it's the loss of the ability to remember short term what things mm. have gone on. But um, I think that, um, you know, the importance for us, we are social creatures, the importance for us of being able to have the collective memory, to be part of the collective memory and um, and to be able to function within what capacities we do have at any time, whether we are infants or whether we are on our deathbeds or whatever, whatever stage we are in between, mm -hmm. to be able to experience the love of uh, friends and the family and community and uh, uh, and especially of our enemies, the, the need for the transformative experiences that turn our enemies into our closest friends. The insistence on being able to find within every enemy the best friend, the energy of that. I think that when we put our energies into those things, we improve the universe, I think. Mm -hmm. I, I think the tinier the action that we do, uh, the more insignificant it is, the more powerful it is. That's that's one of my little um, notions that I have. I think that it may not have many repercussions here, but it'll form a galaxy somewhere else. <laughs> <laughs> well, Joy, I'm waiting for your book of notions to come out coming 2022. <laughs> Seems like there's a lot of great life advice in there. You know, going back to what you said, you're not seeing a decline in creativity or a capacity to think, but you are seeing you know, difficulties with memories, right? Do you find yourself on a daily basis like fighting against that, um, frustrated by that, or, or how does it affect you know, the way you'd yeah. like to, to work and, and think? Um, I think I probably don't think about it that much. I'm just aware of it. And uh, I think that what I need to put more energy into is um, is friendship itself with uh, whoever mm -hmm. you know, with family, with uh, community, with um, and and I I believe what Margaret Mead said that never doubt that a small group of committed people can change the mm -hmm. world. Indeed, it's the only thing that ever has. That's mm -hmm. her saying. So I think that one of the best things we can do for the rest of our lives is have this small community of activist friends that people who who share. Uh, a common goal and who act, you know, action doesn't have to be a big deal. It can be as simple as picking up a pen, that is action. But I think we need the action uh, and, and the action needs to precede our thinking. At least that's what I've found is that if I act first, the thought will follow. I, I have eyes in the back of my head. I see and I understand after something has happened, after I've done something. So, so I'm a strong believer in, in the act. You did a lot of activism work on the topic of redress for the Japanese Canadian community, right? Because when a lot of these families were moved into internment camps, their homes and belongings were sold um, and then they never returned back to them again. Can you talk a little bit more about what that activism, you know, how did it start? What was the result of it? Well, uh, I think the thing that uh, fueled, fueled me the most was the spiritual strength of the first generation, the East, the immigrant generation. They came and I never heard them saying a negative word about the government or about what had happened. Instead, their minds were filled with gratitude. That's all I ever heard from that generation of people in my childhood. That's what I remember. I know they they lost they lost everything physical, uh, material, um, but they kept their gratitude. And um, having having seen that and experienced that, uh, I want to go with that, and I want to have that as well to be focused on, you know, they say we become what we behold. So I want to behold, not hatred, not anger, not, I mean, they, they have their place. Um, there is positive energy, there's negative energy. They're both needed for the train to go up the hill. One's in the front, it needs to mm -hmm. be loved. The train at the, the engine at the back, it needs to be anger and they both go up the hill. They both are required. 
but I think that we need to be led by love and um, you know whether it's love for the children I mean that that's the phrase that I heard most in my childhood is kodomo no tame for the sake of the children we will endure so um, you know the love for the child the love for the parents the love for the community the love for God the love for the universe whatever the love is it needs to be the engine at the front that pulls us along I remember reading articles about how you had led the charge a lot for, you know, um, conversations of redress, you know, conversations of public acknowledgement about what had happened, et cetera. Do you, you know, this must have been a while ago, but I'm, I'm curious to know, how did this all start? How did that chapter of activism start for you? Um, well, um, it started with friendships, you know, with uh, gatherings of uh, a few people, with discussions. Every, every action that I've been involved with began with conversations with a few people over a length of time, usually about a year. And, um, you know, regular, steady gatherings, the intention of it, seeing those movements sometimes fray, split apart, but, but continuing with it. And that, that seems to be, have been an aspect of every action that I've taken anyway, is uh, small groups, small groups of friends and discussions over time, not giving up on them. And then uh, seeing action forming and then uh, going through. And, and this reminds again of the quote that you said earlier by Margaret Mead, never doubt that a small group of, you know, committed citizens can make some change, right? Because indeed yeah. it's the only thing that ever has. Were you satisfied with, you know, the results of your activism, the outcomes of your activism? I'm not sure that everyone here knows what happened as a result. So I just want to share with them. Yeah. Am I satisfied? Well, I've never thought of that word, <laughs> you know, was it satisfied? It's just what was. And, uh, um, you know, being involved with a group of people coming to a certain, a certain step along the way, um, I guess you'd have to say that was pretty satisfying to, to do that and to be part of that and to look back and say, yeah, we did that. Um, it wasn't a big deal, you know, there are some big deals in the world, it's not a big thing, but uh, it was a life and it was, um, it was terrific. And I, and I, I am very glad at my age to be able to have had that kind of life. And I think, okay, what is it today? What, what would draw me today? And I, I think about the, um, the, the climate activists of the day, people like Catherine Hayhoe or, um, you know, the various people that I know that are working so hard to uh, use nuclear fuel, or there's a friend of mine, Peter Ottensmeyer, that is uh, working on uh, spreading the word that we can use up this fuel, you know. All these people that are working um, to save the planet, to save humanity, to save, um, you know, a, a future for the kids. I find that inspiring and makes me want to be part of that uh, effort. Um, mm -hmm. in whatever way I can be, uh, even at this stage of life. And um, yeah, so, so I'm truly deeply grateful for this opportunity to be able to say anything like this and uh, to know that, uh, you know, even in the 80s, in the 90s, uh, you can still be relevant. And um, even if you don't, in terms of actual physical action, do anything, even if you sit there and think about it, or, you know, Catherine Hayhoe says, just have a conversation mm -hmm. <laughs> about climate change. And I think that's enough. That becomes part of the silver buckshot, you know, instead of the mm -hmm. silver bullet. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Well, speaking of, you know, at this stage of life, right? Um, we have, a, I believe, uh, two questions that I want to get to before we close this conversation. Um, you know, at, at this stage of life, what do you feel like is most important to you? Right? I, I hear a lot of themes, um, but I want to hear from you. What is most important to you? Well, the spiritual life is because you know the physical body is 
<laughs> so much in decline. But um, so so what is what do I mean by the spiritual life? Well, I I think you know we we have a world that is filled with um, with um, all these different faiths that people have about that word, and uh, and you know underlying them all is something that we call love, and um, so that feels to me to be the the important thing at this stage in life is is the role of the spiritual in people's lives, especially people when you're getting close to the end. Mm -hmm. What you seek, I think, I think what people are seeking is a kind of peaceful passage. They, you know, you, there's that, they, that phrase, rage, rage against the dying of the light. I don't, yeah. I don't think I want to rage and rage against <laughs> it. I want to be able to welcome and to be confident and um, you know, and to know that um, a peace, a peaceable tomorrow, is it, it, it's maybe it's a dream, maybe it's um, it seems to me like the option to choose if we have a choice. Um, but people want whatever is true, and some people truly believe that nothingness is the best we can hope for. <laughs> um, but I don't know that we can imagine yeah. nothingness. I think we who are conscious beings mm. cannot imagine an absence of consciousness. I cannot imagine that. So, Well, Joy, talking to you today, um, certainly you, you have that peaceful aura about you. And at 86 years young, I still think you have that optimism you know, for the world and a very, very sharp mind. I know you said your memory is not what it used to be. So I can't imagine if we had this interview, let's say four decades ago, what our conversation would have, it would have been, you know, back and forth. Um, you, what, you would have probably been very, very quick. So with this, I want to ask you, is there, you know, looking back at a storied life, is there anything else you'd like to share with our audience before we close off for the day? I can't think of anything right now, but um, I will after as soon as we end this, I'll think of a lot of things. <laughs> well, how about this? What's the what's the first thing you'd like to do? Um, you know, when the world returns back to a more normal state, you know, sometime well, I hope twenty twenty two. You know, but I I I have I'm not sure what's around the corner, so I don't know that we're ever going to go back. Um, I think that everything is so unpredictable. So what I think is important is to trust, to trust uh, in the benevolence. I, I trust that there is an arc of goodness and we're on it. Hmm. And, and it's going in the direction that we want it to go. And um, we, we, go, we go there by all the virtues that we've been taught and that we know deeply, we know to be kind, we know to be generous. We know all these things, and we need to practice these things. And um, whether wherever the world is going, and it might be to hell, it might be to heaven, it might be <laughs> something to everything in between. It might be to Charles Dickens' time of the best of times, the worst of times, constantly. It, it's it's you know we don't know what's around the corner. So I just want to trust mm. that. Um, I, I believe in the density of love around us, surrounding us, upholding us, nurturing us, carrying us, taking us there. And I want to rest within that and to be guided and nudged by that in actions and thoughts and in every way. And joining with other people who have that same hope, faith, trust, whatever you want to call it. Um, mm -hmm. uh, uh, strengthens that and is one of the joys of my life. Well, Joy, thank you so much for bringing your light to this world, your stories, this world, and for joining us today um, at Talks at Google. As I said, this was a very special event because it's not every day that I get to interview someone in their mid 80s. And so I will always <laughs> remember this interview. And I'm sure a lot of people have been touched by, by the work that you've done. Um, so without further ado, thank you so much, Joy. It's been a pleasure to have you today at Talks at Google. Thanks. Thank you so much. Thank you.